Hey guys, Dantix here bringing you some brand new Dragon's Dogma 2 news and gameplay. This is a new, extremely deep look at the Mystic Spearhand, the Sorcerer, the Magic Archer and the Trickster, running through most of their skills in detail. This video will also show off enemies battling each other, treasures, mountable ballista, blasting enemies into the sky, the sit back and watch vocation, first person controlled arrows, crazy physics and some new enemies, so let's get right into it. First, I want to show you the single most fun and hilarious skill I've seen showcased in Dragon's Dogma 2 called Unto Sky. Like the name suggests, it hits enemies into orbit. It starts charging, then a smaller enemy gets trapped in the telekinesis. Right after, the Mystic Spearhand gives it a huge home run swing, sending the creature flying into the distance, dealing huge damage and functioning as a great way to crowd control. So if that wasn't enough, here it is again, punting this enemy over a cliff. Incredibly awesome. Speaking of awesome, Magic the Gathering is crossing over with Fallout and you gotta check out this set. If you like the Fallout series, card games or even collector's items, this set has fun mechanics and incredible art. I just got back from playing some games with three mates and I never thought I'd say this, but Dogmeat thrashed Liberty Prime to win me the game. The deck I helmed is all about getting the bestest boy out early, leveling up my creatures via enchantments and loading them up with equipment. I went all in with an attack against the Liberty Prime deck, but Paladin Dance nobly sacrificed himself to not only give all my opponent's blockers indestructible, but to ensure he had enough to swing in for the counter attack. Thankfully I used inventory management to instantly swap my champion's helm and behemoth sledge over to my blocking Preston Garvey, who didn't partake in the initial attack, giving me enough life to survive and finish it next round. These are rad decks. So if you're interested in finding out more, follow the link below. Continuing on, here's the Magic Archer in action. In the first game, they were a pure damage vocation. Now they're a damage vocation with some support. Here we see the vocation skill, Pinpoint Volley, which you hold down to paint targets, then release to unleash a volley of magical arrows. The player then presses the conversion button and changes it from Pinpoint Volley to Rivet Shot. Unclear of the exact difference between these skills, but it seems like Pinpoint is more accurate for targeting weak points and the other can hit multiple targets. The player then fires a Frost Hunter Bolt, which is a nice attack that hits multiple times. We then see Flame Fang Arrow being fired. Notably, this skill makes the camera follow behind the arrow, which fires slowly in the direction you control, exploding when it reaches the destination you direct it to, leaving burning terrain. But again, you can see how the player wheels at mid-air and curves it to ensure it hits an unaware goblin's head. Some more rivet shots later and the griffin joins the fight. Using the Flame Fang Arrow, the player is able to hit it even though it leaps into the air. Flying enemies don't like to be shot, so after a few rivet shots, it falls to the ground. A combination of that and the flame fang arrows pummel the beast while it's on the ground, burning through one of its four health bars. It's rightly pissed after that. Here we see the player being ambushed by a minotaur. The player uses the skill Ricochet Hunter, which I'll run through soon, and Frost Hunter Bolt, which I'll also go through soon. It seems spamming the Flame Fang Arrow was the best strategy as it does a ton of damage to the enemy, as you can see by its health bar flying down. You'll also notice that the player doesn't use the first person aiming of the Flame Fang. The last one hitting a wall but still doing huge damage to the Minotaur. The skill is notably good at hitting aerial targets as it can get a cluster of them with one arrow. You can shoot your arrow between them and release it to explode to take them both out. If you want you can just observe the battleground before dropping it right on top of an enemy's weak spot. It really is a good skill for targeting weak points as the glowing blue spots on this golem are difficult to hit unless you climb it. So like mentioned before, the Frost Hunter Bolt sends out magical bolts that pummel your enemy and build up a freeze effect that stops them in their place. In this game, any stun or freeze effects are extremely valuable. So firing this mixed in with rivet and basic attacks is excellent when you want to sit back at a distance. Now let's discuss the situational skill Ricochet Seeker. It looks extremely cool and a nightmare to code, but doesn't seem to work well outside of caves and narrow environments. Here though, it shines. Maybe a bit too brightly as it absolutely rips through enemies. The more a shot bounces, the stronger it gets, meaning you want this to ricochet around to really clear out thick enemies. You may notice that nights are extremely dark in Dragon's Dogma, so torches are naturally recommended. Unless, of course, you're the magic archer. You can cast the skill Candescent Orb to light your path. It doesn't seem to cost much stamina, so casting this as you move forward and look around seems extremely useful, as falling off a cliff will usually kill you. Now I mentioned this vocation can cast support skills, and one of them is the Remedy Arrow. 
This can revive down pawns from a distance without you having to walk over and hold a button in the middle of combat. You just have to wait for the circle bar to charge. You then release and the arrows will travel out, heal your pawn and they'll be right back in the fight. The final skill I want to show off is Hailstone Bolt which builds up a huge chunk of ice on your bow until you release it. It doesn't travel very far, it's hard to aim and it takes a long time to charge up but it does massive damage. It's a great way to open up a fight. Like I mentioned in the previous video, there are physically resistant enemies as well as magic resistant enemies. It seems Hailstone Bolt is one of the few physical skills the magic archer has, meaning it can be used to pummel these magic resistant golems weak points for huge damage, as you can see. Moving on, it's not just you versus the world. Creatures will fight each other in Dragon's Dogma 2. Here we witness a drake fighting a cyclops. It seems like they're so engrossed in their battle that they don't even notice the player and their party joining in on the fight. Notably, this also confirms the existence of static mountable weapons like the ballista. You can draw the string back by holding down a button or key, and when it's fully locked, release to unleash an explosive bolt. The drake is a much tougher enemy than the cyclops, so the player rightly targets it to even the fight and ensure two kills with less effort. We also notice that the mage pawn can cast an ice weapon buff. So far we've seen fire, lightning and ice, and no doubt there'll be different pros and cons versus different enemies, as well as different effects. Your pawn's inclination, which I've mentioned in other videos, may, if it's like the first game, influence how much your pawns work around the strengths and weaknesses of your enemies with their attacks. Let's go back to the Mystic Spearhand. It's a fast and furious glass cannon magic and melee vocation. He opens up with the weapon skill Sky Dragon's Fang Tooth, which we saw in the Mystic Spearhand trailer. It teleports you to the back of large enemies and attacks. In this case, the player uses the grab action right after in order to latch onto the drake's back while it takes flight. He has enough stamina to stick through the ground slam. He then uses basic attacks to damage it, but is eventually thrown off. Cut ahead and he's spamming the basic attack in order to spin and spear the enemy and do continuous AoE damage. Luckily the drake is too busy casting a spell in order to fight back. It's unclear what this spell did, but it looks like it buffed him up. He continues to lay into the drake's chest wound. Using the sky dragon's fang 2 skill, he tries to get onto the drake's back, but misses. It seems a skilled mystic spear hand using the dashes and teleports will be able to dodge attacks and dish out extreme weak point damage. The drake finally finishes off the cyclops with its fire breath, as well as two of your pawns. Naturally revenge is in order, so when the drake is hovering in the air casting another spell, the mystic spear hand casts forbidding bolt, which is a ranged magic attack that paralyzes targets. He then uses Sky Dragon's Fang Tooth again to get back on board the Drake, which is normally difficult for a melee class as they would need to somehow grab the tail and start scaling up. As flashy as the player's attacks were, they didn't grab on and the Drake simply crashes to the ground to throw him off. This kills the player and they need to use a Wake Stone to revive mid-battle. Wake Stones are extremely rare and expensive, so they aren't something you want to use casually. I don't think the fight went well as the footage of the Drake combat ends here. Cut ahead and the mystic spear hand is tackling something more manageable, a pack of wolves. He opens up with forbidding bolt but misses. He then charges the skill magic spear pilot which sends out a powerful blast of magic that deals a lot of damage to the wolves in an AoE around it. Here it is again being used against a cyclops. Notably it gives the spear hand another ranged attack though it needs to charge and fire immediately after. Here we see the mystic spear hand scaling a cyclops. It swings around to the front of its head and starts stabbing it in the face with its basic attack, Twin Cut. Notably all the spear hand skills are spelt differently for a reason I'm sure someone will tell me in the comments. The constant barrage of damage ends up tripping the beast and smashing its head into a tree. While it's knocked out, the spear hand and crew dish out so much damage that the fight seems like a cakewalk. Here's the skill Humble Offering. It basically turns you into a medieval Jedi, letting you fling around destructible items in the world or bodies. You can fling alive or dead enemies at each other for huge damage. The easiest use is to throw enemies off cliffs or into the water, but using a big enemy's minions against them will be hilarious. So I've mentioned Redoubted and Forbidding Bolt, but what exactly are they? Well, they are vocation skills. They're placed on the same button your shield block would be if you were a fighter. You can cast Redoubted Bolt like normal to paralyze your target, but by holding it down and charging, it becomes Forbidding Bolt. The difference is if you press jump right after your target flashes blue, you'll teleport to them, letting you grab on and follow up with attacks to this ogre's weak points. 
Here we see the skill Dragon's Foin, launching the Mystic Spearhand forward into the air, yet another skill that makes getting to flying or large targets much easier. It seems to lock onto what you're aiming at, so it even works if you're targeting a small goblin that's on the ground. Here's more of the Sky Dragon's Fang Tooth skill outside of using it against oversized enemies. This is an example of how a skill used for a particular purpose can have multiple, as it flings you into the air and slams you back down, dealing damage in an AoE. However, if you time the attack right before you're hit by an enemy, it'll deal more damage, like it's parrying the attack. So the Mystic Spearhand is not a tanky class, but they can cast a magical barrier that protects against all incoming damage for a very short time. It's called Mirror Vesture, and it will affect nearby pawns as well. It's perfect for casting on yourself before attempting to revive a fallen pawn who's in front of a drake shooting fire at you. Yes, I'm glad I have an option for that. So the player decides to take on a drake without knowledge of how his skills work and naturally is punished. After a few basic attacks and a redoubted bolt, he decides to cast Setching Storm. It generates orb-like blades and they fly out after enemies. Because the drake absolutely wrecks the player, we can't see what it actually does. Does it build up over time for a paralyzing effect? It does deal damage to small enemies, but seems rather underwhelming considering the flashiness of the rest of the Mystic Spear Hand. So be sure to always high five your pawns when they put their hands out, it's just a decent thing to do. Or you could just throw them off a cliff. It seems there are environmental secrets in the world. Here we see a trebuchet. Find and place some rocks in it, set it off and it'll hit a wall. Try again and the wall will knock down, revealing a secret area with no doubt some treasure. We can expect many of these littered around the world. Secrets like this Seeker's Token. There are 240 of these hidden in the world and if you bring them to a guild hall, you'll receive special rewards. We've seen a few of the sorcerer's skills already, but here is a much clearer view of them. First up is Frigga. With the handy magical rune effects, you can see how long a spell is taking to cast. When the circle fully contracts, the spell will cast. In this case, setting off a wall of ice that does high damage. You can also run up the leftover ice and strike at a large enemy's head or jump on its back if you so choose. Next is High Leaven. Once cast, lightning will rapidly strike the area. You can keep the strikes going by pressing any of the face buttons normally reserved for weapon skills. This will keep draining your stamina as you follow up though, until you're out. The next skill is Decanter, and it's a spell that drains an enemy's health. Because there isn't an enemy here, we'll see it in action later. Finally, let's take a look at the last skill this sorcerer has equipped, Haggle. It summons a mighty storm that does damage over time and slows enemies. Here we see Haggle in action. You'll notice the circle contracts slower as the player moves around, meaning you should try to cast when you're out of direct combat and behind your pawns. The spell goes off and the enemy immediately finds a way to run out of it before it freezes. Then we see Decanter being cast on a harpy. You'll notice the player channeling light out of the creature, doing damage over time until it dies. You'll notice that it doesn't drain any more stamina from you than the initial cost of casting the spell, meaning this will be a great single target ability. As the harpy is flying around, singing to put a player to sleep, he casts High Leaven on his friend accidentally, then casts it again on the flying and singing harpy and gets it in one hit. He finishes the fight by using the vocation skill Galvanize, which recharges his stamina, even though he didn't need to. Now we're switching over to the Trickster, which is honestly going to be difficult to play since it's a pure support and environmental advantage vocation. It's especially hard when you're new or had to jump into a mid-game character like the folks over at Arx Gaming. Here we see the player using the basic and heavy attack on a goblin, realizing very quick that it does no damage and instead builds aggro on the creature. He backs up and tries another skill, the Elusive Divider. This simply places a wall that enemies can't see in front of you, so it really doesn't help in this situation. The Trickster then uses Aromatic Rally, which may just be the most reliable skill they have. It buffs all your pawns to do a ton more damage, as you can see the enemy starting to melt very quickly. This finishes the fight and the Trickster gets to rank 5 in its vocation. I'd be scared to take on this fight early as the Trickster, but here we are facing down a Griffin. Rightfully, he opens with Aromatic Rally, which lets his pawns start dishing out some damage. The player tries a heavy attack, but to no avail, and then casts another Elusive Divider. The player then uses a spell that separates them from their body and allows them to relocate illusions they create to places where the spirit is. This is a great scouting tool and tool to trick enemies into jumping off cliffs, but the player learns quickly it's useless mid-fight. He then tries some light attacks against the Griffin, which naturally does nothing. He then realizes that the Aromatic Rally may be his best bet, so he casts that, runs away, and puts two walls between him and the Griffin. 
Luckily, the beast has had enough and flies away. Probably felt a bit embarrassed for the trickster. Here we see the trickster at it again with two armored cyclops. He casts his light attack against the cyclops, which turns into a ranged attack when charged. Once again, there's no point doing this unless you're trying to pull aggro and lead an enemy away to a trick or a trap or get them off your pawns. He then follows up with the aromatic rally to buff them up. He then casts suffocating shroud, which is just a big AOE aggro puller, so it does nothing again. He resorts to putting up a wall, doing nothing, then casting the pawn damage buff over and over watching the fight play out. At this point, I think it clicked in the player's head that this class is difficult to play without some forward planning and knowledge of exactly what the skills do. The trickster, of course, is rewarded karmically when the beast throws his massive club at him. Looked like it honestly should have hurt a lot more than it did, so perhaps the trickster is more tanky than it appears, though the attack does stun the player to a crawl. The fight continues and we noticed in the previous video you can set larger enemies off balance, but here we see you can also grab them and push or pull in order to knock them over. So when you see the Cyclops stagger, it's time to go for the knockdown. The player doesn't do this, however, and when the Cyclops staggers, it's a pawn who does the damage to push it forward and slam its head into the wall, killing it right away. The next Cyclops projects its massive attack for so long that if you ever get hit by this, you deserve to die and restart the fight. It does, though, do a massive AoE which rips the ground up. The pawns have some great AI as Emma lays into its leg as it does that attack, stumbling it, while the other climbs over it and attacks. So that's everything. What did you think of the gameplay? Are you more or less excited for Dragon's Dogma 2? Let me know below. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't and hit that bell because I'm going to be bringing you a ton of content very soon. Until then, ciao friends.